All right, so hello everyone. <laughs> so I'm Tomo, I'm nuclear theorist, and uh, I did my PhD in 2002 uh, with Paul Bonch, and then I went to the US. I did a postdoc at Argonne, and then I was faculty at Michigan State until 2008, and that's when I came back to CSLA, where I've been since. Uh, and in fact, in the first part of my career, I was doing more what we call energy density functional methods. And around 2010, uh, I turned into ab initio methods, which is what I'll be talking about today. And uh, yeah, so what I'd like to do today is tell you about precisely the recent progress in uh, ab initio calculations. And actually, I'm going to give you some, a rather technical uh, presentation, uh, historical perspective, uh, a little bit like if an experimentalist would like to explain how the whole history of development of gamma detec detectors that uh, would end up in Agatha, that's what I want to do, to tell you how you, uh, how you can foresee the, the technical development that made the, the, the ab initio calculation we can do today possible. So uh, let me start by thanking my collaborators on Abinicio because uh, especially people at SACLE who have gone through SACLE because many of the things that I'll be discussing have been done in, uh, in, in collaboration with them in one way or another. All right, so the basically one can state the, the, the goal of Abinicio uh, calculation as the uh, trying to answer the question of whether nuclear systems can be described in a certain theoretical scheme where you describe the system in terms of effective degrees of freedom that are nucleons, which interact in a way that is rooted into the underlying theory of quantum chromodynamics, uh, in a way that could be hopefully systematic. That means uh, all aspects of nuclear phenomenology could be described within this scheme in a consistent way, and in a way that would be accurate enough, uh, given the question we are uh, giving ourselves to answer. And, in particular, in a way that is relevant to experimental uncertainty. So having stated this, this long-term goal, you can already uh, realize that as of 2023, uh, a rather large part of the phenomenology uh, of low energy nuclear physics can be addressed in ab initio. Here I have given a snapshots of, mm -hmm. of some recent works on various topics that actually can be, uh, can be done uh, in an ab initio way. But as you will see in a restricted part of the nuclear chart, uh, but this is already way better than what where we were about 15 years ago. So if you if you uh, go back 15 years, uh, you the nuclear chart, the ab initio nuclear chart would look like this, and basically you would have only very uh, light nuclei that could be addressed uh, with such a, such type of methods. And if we jump to today. Uh, that's that's what you have. So you can see that we have made a tremendous progress uh, in being able to calculate nuclei ab initio, at least in some part of the nuclear chart and for some observable, not all. And so what I'd like to discuss is uh, how was that made possible? What are the major difficulties in trying to do that? Uh, why it was not done faster? And can we actually go uh, even beyond that? So I'll start by defining what we mean by ab initio in low energy nuclear physics. And then the, the, that will take uh, about 10 minutes. And then I spend the rest on the uh, one key aspect of it, which is how do you, uh, how can you solve the a body Schrodinger equation? And I will start by telling you what is the essentially fundamental problem, which is called the curse of dimensionality. Then uh, I will, uh, mention a subleading technical problem, which has also to do with how to handle the dimensionality of the problem. Uh, then I'll tell you the story of how we, what sort of formal development have been made in order to go beyond these very light nuclei and in a first step uh, into the, the regime of mean mass nuclei, but limited to what we call uh, doubly closed shell nuclei. Then I will do a detour if time allows. Uh, uh, discussing the evaluation of systematic and statistical uncertainty, which are becoming a very important part of this endeavor because we wish to uh, provide predictions uh, accompanied by uh, uncertainties of various types. And I will try to list 
most of them uh, as, as I go. And then that is, as the last point, I'll try to explain you uh, how uh, after we managed to uh, tackle W close, close shell nuclei, we uh, try to go for, further and describe the large majority of the rest of nuclei, which happen to be of open shell character. So it's very probable that I will not get to the end of the story. Uh, so I'll stop wherever I am at the end. I could negotiate with organizer a second session, but probably they won't agree. So uh, let's see where it takes, uh, takes us. All right, so uh, let me start by first defining in a, in a few words what we mean by ab initio theoretical scheme. So in nuclear physics, there are basically two domains that are well separated by, by an actual separation of scale, of energy scale. There is the high energy domain, uh, which happens around the GeV scale, which is basically the domain of hadronic physics, which is explicitly governed by quantum dynamics, where you describe systems in terms of quarks and gluons. And at much lower energy is the domain of uh, nuclear structure and reactions, so the domain of uh, interest into nuclei. And basically, uh, that's the domain we are interested in here. And in this context, uh, what we mean by ab initio today is actually a certain uh, so-called effective field theory, which is Carroll effective field theory, which is a low energy realization of QCD. So basically, a, form, a, sim a simple formulation or simple formulation of QCD at low energy uh, that is manageable in a domain where uh, QCD direct QCD is highly non-perturbative. So in this realization of QCD, you describe the system in terms of effective degrees of freedom that are nucleons and pions. These are the explicit degrees of freedom you deal with. And the pion is, uh, is the anomalously light meson, which is uh, the manifestation of the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry uh, at low energy. And uh, basically, in this formulation, in this EFT, uh, we keep the explicit, the interaction between nucleons, which is driven by the exchange of pions uh, because of this anomalously light mass of the pion. Whereas everything that is not explicitly re, uh, tackled, that which relates to, which is rooted in the high energy, for instance, the exchange in the language of mesons, that would be the exchange of uh, heavier mesons, so that which is responsible for the short range of the interaction. Uh, so this is uh, modeled in a systematic way by a uh, uh, basis of operators, which are uh, delta contact operators and derivative of contact operators. When you do this scheme in a systematic way, you see that there is an infinite number of, oper of interaction operators between nucleons that are compatible with the symmetries of QCD. And in order to do anything uh, concrete, you need to, as a first step, to organize this infinite number of operators of interaction operators according to their expected importance. And this is called the power counting. And there are various ways of it. The, 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 the dominant is called the uh, Weinberg power counting, Weinberg being the, the person who uh, initiated this Carroll effective field theory. And based on this expected importance of the various interaction terms, uh, then you will uh, organize them and truncate them, truncate this infinite series to make a finite, finite series and work at a certain working order K. And because already right here, you truncate the infinite number of allowed operators in the Hamiltonian, you have a first source of uncertainty associated with the term you will not consider at a working order. Furthermore, because uh, we uh, don't uh, treat explicitly the high energy or we model the high energy via this uh, uh, basis of operators, the, this operator come with uh, parameters, low energy couplings that needs to be adjusted on the set of data. And through this adjustment, there is a second sort of uncertainty, which is a statistical nature, and that we also have to, uh, to uh, gauge. So when you realize this program, it's a long effort, you end up with a, a, a drawing like this, where you have all the possible interaction operators between the nucleons. So in the columns, you have uh, the operators uh, contributing the two, to the two nucleon interaction in the second column, the three nucleon interaction in the third column, the fourth nucleon interaction, and so on. 
And the different lines correspond to these different orders at which you can work. So if you implement the scheme at the most, uh, uh, at the simplest uh, leading order, you will have a, a very, uh, actually too simplistic version of the nuclear Hamiltonian with two nuclear interaction only. You can refine by going at next order by uh, adding uh, appropriate physics to your two nuclear force. And uh, still at this level, you only have uh, two nuclear interaction, but at next to next to needing order appear for the first time three nuclear interactions which are predicted in the theory to exist, but are also predicted to be uh, subleading because they only appear at the, the next to next to leading order. And if you go to the, yet the next order, you will have the appearance of uh, four body forces and so on and so forth until this becomes too complicated to implement. So some of the questions uh, that are raised here at the, at the level of constructing the internuclear interactions are whether we can uh, live without we know we cannot live without three body forces in order to do uh, decent nuclear physics. But the question, for instance, is can we uh, live without four nuclear forces in, nucle in nuclei that are many more nucleons than three? And as I, I will tell you later, if we have to include three, four nuclear forces, it, it will make our life even more miserable, meaning even more difficult. There are more profound issues that uh, specialists of this uh, Carroll effective theory debate today, but I don't want to get into that. So for me, it's uh, enough to, to say that uh, until basically the 90s, uh, we were using realistic nuclear nuclear interaction that, were, that we denote as phenomenological. And that's in the 90s that uh, one bank first uh, proposed this Carroll effective theory uh, formalism uh, that is systematic and rooted into the underlying QCD and that colleagues further pushed to make it practical such that in the basically years 2000, the first uh, high precision model of nuclear nuclear and three nuclear interaction based on Carroll effective theory were produced and used in many body calculations. And basically since the beginning of the 2010, we are in what I could call the, the Carroll effective theory era. Um, so once you have uh, design your uh, nuclear Hamiltonian based on this rational. Uh, the next step, obviously, is to go and solve your, the dynamical equation of your system, which is the A-body-Schrodinger equation. And uh, that's what many body physicists are uh, essentially uh, trying to do. And as you will see, this becomes quickly impossible to do exactly. So whenever you solve this Schrodinger equation, there will be uh, novel source, additional sources of error that you have to control and gauge of several source actually. And so eventually the question is uh, with what uh, accuracy can we manage to solve the Schrodinger equation? Does this accuracy depend on the number of nucleons in your system? As you will see, uh, that's def definitely the case. And also uh, the type of uh, formalisms that or methods that we use to solve the Schrodinger equation approximately uh, do they depend on the type of nuclei that we uh, are dealing with? And this will also become clearer in, in, uh, in the, the rest of my talk. So now I'm getting into this. Uh, so we imagine we have uh, produced a model of nuclear interaction via Carroll effective theory, and we want to solve the A-body Schrodinger equation. So I will try in, a, in a, one slide to explain what is the basically the the fundamental difficulty of the A-body A problem. So if you want to solve this equation, basically the difficulty or the complexity to solve this equation directly relate to the dimension of the Hilbert space that your wave function psi lives in. So if you have a one body, just a single nucleon, then you have, uh, your ket is in the one body uh, Hilbert space, uh, which I call H1. And in fact, this Hilbert space is already infinitely dimensional, but in practice, to do anything practice, you will have to uh, truncate that dimensionality to a finite dimension and basically uh, employ uh, a basis of your Hilbert space of finite dimension. And this finite dimension I will call n-dim through the rest of my talk, and this will be an important parameter for, for the rest of the story. So you have a basis of the one body Hilbert space, but what you want to do is solve, for instance, uh, the Schrodinger equation for calcium 40, so for 40 particles, not one. 
if you want to do that, then the Hilbert space you are dealing with is in mathematical terms, the tensor product of 40 one body Hilbert space. And so the dimension that you are dealing with now is n dim, n dim, the one body Hilbert space dimension to the power a, here would be a equal 40. Okay? That increase of the dimensionality, that exponential increase of the dimensionality with the number of particles is what is called in many body physics, the curse of dimensionality. And to make it a little bit more concrete, what what it quickly leads to, uh, let's imagine we have given ourselves a basis of the one body Hilbert space. So it has n dim vectors in the basis. So correspondingly, the basis of my a body Hilbert space, which is a set of Slater determinants with uh, a particles, has a number of n dim to the power a vectors. So if I want to find the solution of the Schrodinger equation, one brute force way which to do, which is actually one of the ab initio methods we use in practice, which is the spirit of the no core shell model, is to look for the uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian under the form of a linear combination of the basis states of the Slater determinant. And this sum contains n dim to the power a terms. So if you plug this and the unknown here are the coefficient of the linear combination, that's what you want to uh, to find by solving the Schrodinger equation. So if you plug this ansatz into the Schrodinger equation, you can rephrase it as a matrix di diagonalization problem, where the eigenvectors are the co linear coefficient, the, the coefficient of the linear uh, sum that you are uh, trying to, to, to find, and the eigenvalue are the energies. Now, the problem is that this matrix that you have to diagonalize has dimension n dim to the power a times n dim to the power a. So if you put numbers in, some sort of a naive way. Let's look at what you are facing. So if in the one body Hilbert space, a little bit arbitrarily here, you use 100 states. Uh, so you truncate your basis of the one body Hilbert space to 100 basis states. Then for car carbon 12, the dimension of your Hilbert space will be 10 to the 24. Now, if you look at what you can do on the computer, you will realize that basically, uh, if your matrix has dimension that is smaller than 10 to the 5, you can exactly diagonalize numerically your matrix, so you're happy. If your matrix has dimension between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 10, you can use particular techniques like Lanchos techniques to extract a few eigenvectors. And if your matrix is greater than 10 to the 10, you are done. Okay, so even though my 10 to the 24 was a little bit naive in the way I, I calculated here, because there are tricks to reduce it, it happens that indeed carbon 12 is essentially the limit of what you can do with such a brute force exact solving of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and so that's, that's exactly why, uh, as I will show in a minute, uh, the um, ab initio methods were limited to uh, basically carbon 12 or oxygen 16 uh, until 15 years ago. So if I add now to my chronology uh, many body calculation, in the 90s, there were indeed the formulation of brute force way to solve the Schrodinger equation. So this Norco shell model I was mentioning, it's a brute diagonalization. A little bit before, there were another techniques called Green's function Monte Carlo that allowed to do uh, ab initio calculation of p-shell nuclei. And that's why we were, until 2005, limited to this very uh, small uh, region of the, of the nuclear chart. So here is a, 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 a historical example um, of such ab initio calculation in the p-shell. So this is done here with green function Monte Carlo. You can see on this plot the the low-lying low states of, uh, of uh, quite a few p-shell nuclei up to carbon-12, which this calculation were done with uh, this so-called phenomenological interaction that were available at the time, and compared to experiments in, 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 uh, in green. And if you look in detail, you will see a rather, uh, rather very good description of, of such p-shell nuclei. This is an updated version of the same sort of plot, although uh, limited to ground state here. This time does with, done with the other method, the no-caution model, and uh, using a, a more modern 
can hold effective field theory interaction. Um, so essentially, using brute force method, quasi exact method, we can uh, deal with nuclei at exponential costs, meaning exponential with the number of particles, but that, that limits us to basically nuclei that have no more than 16 particles. With some further tricks, you can go up to oxygen isotopes maybe, but this is really uh, a hard limit. So if you want to go beyond this very small part of the nuclear chart, you need to change uh, philosophy and try to solve the Schrodinger equation using explicitly approximated methods, uh, but these methods need to be systematic and, and systematically improvable and accurate enough. But you need to use approximate method to turn the, the, the cost, which was exponential with the number of particles, into a polynomial cost with n dim, uh, where the exponent of the polynomial doesn't depend on the number of particles. So if you can do that, then you can beat this curse of dimensionality and go to greater nuclei, at least if you can do this while having a small enough error. So before we deal with this, uh, trying to beat the, 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 the curse of dimensionality and go beyond P shell, uh, you still need to, to, to worry a little bit about the uh, problem of dimensionality. But so even if you are beating the, the major problem, which is the fact that the brute force solving scale has n dim to the power a, uh, this n dim is a bit artificial because as I said at the beginning, the uh, one body Hilbert space should be infinitely dimensional. So if you truncate it to n dim dimension, uh, you need to have n dim large enough such that your result do not depend effectively, at least to a small error on this, on this value of n dim. So the question is how much, uh, how small n dim can be and uh, how, how much can we handle? So let me first, deal with this before going back to the curse of dimensionality. So indeed, if you have too large n dim, uh, you will be having a, a first problem even before you get started with your calculation, because you will have a problem of storage, not even CPU to solve the Schrodinger equation, but the problem of storage. Why is that? This is because even before you get started, as, as I explained at the beginning, you have been able to model a nuclear Hamiltonian with kinetic energy, two-body interaction, maybe three-body interaction, if you're working at next to next to leading order in crowd effective theory. And this Hamiltonian comes under this form in second quantization, such that the information in your Hamiltonian is stored into this coefficient, TPQ, et cetera. So in this expression, what is the meaning of these indices P, Q, R, S? These are exactly uh, labels of your states in the single particle basis. So we typically use in ab initio calculation for some reasons, uh, the single particle basis associated with spherical harmonic oscillator. So this uh, basis is, uh, is defined by a certain number of energy shells which are in fact in infinite number, but we truncate it to a certain maximum shell and that defines our dimension n dim. So instead of n dim, sometimes we use a uh, label E max to, to stipulate the highest shell we are using. And uh, this shell have some degeneracy and the single particle states in this uh, shell uh, are denoted by this uh, PQ or this A here. And uh, each single particle uh, state is labeled by a principal quantum number n, orbital angular momentum L, total angular momentum J, projection of J, which is M, and the isospin T. Okay. Now, when you store the two-body interaction, it comes with this under this form, VPQRS. So this is what is called a tensor with four indices. And if you store the three body force, which is here, you have to store a tensor on your computer and with six indices. Each of these index correspond to a single particle basis state. So basically, if you have a K body force to store, two body, three body, this corresponds to storing a two K index tensor. 
And this becomes quickly very expensive if NDIM becomes large, because basically uh, the cost of storing uh, such a tensor is NDIM to the power 2K because there are 2K indices for a K body force. So the, 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 story, the storing grows exponentially with the interaction rank. So storing four nucleon interaction is much more expensive than storing three nucleon interaction, which is much more expensive than two nucleon, etc. cetera. So uh, if the single particle levels are limited to Emax, the, the two body uh, states are limited that enter into the two body operator are, are limited by uh, E2 max, which is twice E max, three body is E3 max and so on. Now, this can quickly become a, a, a huge problem. Uh, actually, in practice, we are helped with the fact that um, there is certain symmetry in the Hamiltonian, angular momentum symmetry and isospin symmetry, such that we can actually reduce the, the storing of the matrix element by going from this so-called uncoupled matrix element to JT coupled matrix element. Uh, don't mind the detail, but the, the effectively what it means is that uh, using the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, we can reduce effectively the endim we have to use. And this means that it's translated into a, a very huge uh, benefit in terms of uh, storing the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. Uh, here, what is plotted is the memory of storing this the three body matrix element. So, this W, P, Q, R, S, T, U, uh, as a function of this parameter E3 max, which uh, is basically uh, a function of the n dim dimension. So, if we don't use this trick, uh, we have uh, humongous. Uh, storage and using this couple matrix element help us to reduce by a factor of 100, for instance, when we use a uh, matrix element uh, up to E3 max 12, uh, we are uh, reducing by a factor of 100 the, story, the storage. The problem is that uh, still the question remains how far we need to go in, uh, in, um, in E3 max as a function of the particle number. So we'll skip a little bit this part, uh, which um, is not very essential. Uh, we just get to the to the point that at the end of the day, typically you have to believe me, but if you are dealing with a nucleus of ma mass about 50, the storage of the three body matrix element at the beginning of the calculation is about, uh, you need to go to have well converged calculation, you need to go to a basis with E3 max 16, whatever that means as a parameter. But it means eventually that you are dealing with a storage of 25 gigabytes. And this is what makes a initial calculation of mass around up to mass 180 possible. But if you want to do an even heavier system like mass 100, you will realize that you need larger NDIM which means eventually larger E3 max here, such that your matrix element you have to store becomes 300, more than 300 gigabytes, and this is too much to handle. Because this very problem at the end of the day, this very problem of the dimensionality uh, that you need to have to have well-converged calculation can limit the range of ab initial calculation. Okay. So today we are more or less limited to as you uh, have seen on the chart, we are basically limited about uh, mass 100, and this is primarily because of this storing problem. All right, so at the end of the day, uh, that was a, that's a problem we have to keep in mind, the, the limit of uh, about mass 100 due to this uh, endim we can handle on the computer. But now I need to go back to uh, rather the, this curse of dimensionality, uh, meaning the cost of not just storing the Hamiltonian, but of solving the Schrodinger equation, which scale with uh, exponentially with the number of particles. So how can we go beyond p shell nuclei uh, without being blocked by this curse of dimensionality? And 
as I said earlier, this requires to basically not solve the Schrodinger equation in brute force, but accept to do some approximation that we will try to keep systematic and, and small enough. And this uh, has, is made possible by specific techniques to solve the Schrodinger equation, which comes under the name of expansion many body methods. So I'm, I'm gonna try in one slide to explain you how it works. So instead of trying to solve directly the Schrodinger equation in a brute force way for the Hamiltonian H, which is the, our Hamiltonian of interest, we're gonna split the Hamiltonian in two pieces and all the methods I will talk about after that work with this uh, philosophy. We split the Hamiltonian in two pieces, H0 plus H1, such that H0 is an easy Schrodinger equation to solve. So we separate basically the Hamiltonian into an easy part and a hard part. So the easy part give us as an eigenstate, we can solve this exactly. And this give us this theta zero, which is an approximation. And we call it the unperturbed state. And this sort of approximation is typically a mean field, what you have all seen in, in, in your classes, a spherical artifoc uh, as, a, as, a, as a basic approximation. But of course, this is not enough to get good uh, results for, uh, for nuclei. And you need to do more than that and treat the remaining part, the difficult part H1. And formally speaking, this is done by uh, this so-called wave operator that connects the simplest, the simple state theta zero, which we obtain explicitly by solving the, the first part with H0. And this operator acting on theta zero give us in principle, the state, the full solution of the Schrodinger equation psi. And this omega operator is said to bring in, to adding many body correlation due to the residual interaction H1. So then the question is how to choose theta zero. As I said, typically we will start by choosing a simple spherical artifact and how to handle the difficult part, which is omega. And that's where all the, all the let's say the, the, the creativity of many body uh, theories go is to how to handle omega and bring correlations in such a way that it's efficient. So there are typically two categories of methods uh, which can be classified schematically in this way. First, what is called perturbative methods where basically this wave operator is expanded as a polynomial in the residual interaction H1. This is just a schematic way of writing things. And more advanced methods, uh, which are called non-perturbative methods, where this wave operator is expanded as a power series, but which is not as simple as a polynomial, which is more elaborate and hopefully uh, more efficient. And then the full solution is obtained uh, the action of omega k on, on the theta zero generate a series, which is written here. Uh, for q equals zero, we recover the unperturbed state. Then q equal one is the first correction due to correlation. For q equal uh, two, we obtain a second correction and so on. And that's how we approach systematically the, the result. Of course, if the series is infinite, there is no gain and the, the cost of doing this would still be uh, exponential in the number of particles. But we're gonna truncate this power series to a finite number of terms. That's where the approximation goes. And when you do that, you can obtain this famous linear combination I was talking about earlier at polynomial costs. Of course, these they come with a degree of approximation because you have truncated the sum, but if the approximation is good enough, you have a good answer at polynomial cost. Of course, the higher you go in Q max, the higher the exponent P in the, uh, in the cost of the method. So we say that we have polynomial method because now the cost is not ending to the power A, but ending to P, P being fixed, does not depend on A. And we can cut the sum at Q max equals zero, one, two, three, and refine the result. That's exactly how we improve our 
many body calculation. But eventually, there is a, a truncation of that sum. And so there is a system, another systematic source of error that we have to evaluate due to the term we don't take into account in the, in the expansion. So there is a history of methods that have been designed in this way. And if you look uh, at the past, you will see that uh, the simplest one is so-called many-body perturbation theory on top of a spherical artery fog uh, and perturbed state. This was formulated in 1934 by Moller and Plesset, but implemented in full-fledged uh, with in nuclear physics with two and three nuclear interaction only in 2010. Then there is a set of non-perturbative method with uh, hor horrible acronyms. So first there is this uh, so-called Dyson self-consistent Green's function method, and it was formulated back in 1959, but started to be implemented for realistic ab initio calculation in nuclear physics uh, at the very beginning in 2001, and leading to really uh, actual full-fledged result around 2010. Then there is another category of non-perturbative methods, which was invented in nuclear physics by Koster in 1958, very much developed in quantum chemistry, and re-imported back into nuclear physics around 2005 by Hagen and collaborators. And finally, there is a third uh, uh, non-perturbative method, again with a horrible acronym, which is called Single Reference In Medium Seminarity Renormalization Group, formulated and implemented around 2010. Uh, for a reason I will explain later, this is, however, limited to closed shell. Still, if you go back to history, on the formal level, MBPT, so many body perturbation theory was formulated uh, in 1934. Uh, Green's function and copper cluster in the 50s. This uh, in medium similarity renormalization group uh, around 2010. But in terms of actual implementation, those methods were only, uh, became only available uh, actually closer to 2010 or so. So that's how we went from being limited to P-shell nuclei in, in the beginning of 2000 to expanding ab initio calculation to mid-mass nuclei uh, with these with this various methods. But again, with some limitation because for reason I will explain later, these were limited to doubly closed shell. Still, let me show you one example, uh, illustrate the, this, uh, this uh, first sets of ab initio calculation in mean mass nuclei. And here, what I show you uh, is the binding energy per particle for a series of doubly closed shell system from oxygen 16 to nickel 78. And below the charge or the proton, sorry, the proton uh, RMS no, yeah, radius uh, for the same set of nuclei. And this, I first show you here with the calculation done with the first generation of Carroll effective field theory interaction, actually inconsistent because the two nucleon and the three nucleon force were not used at the same Carroll order in the Carroll expansion I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, the situation was that for binding energy, we were very happy with the results as you can see in oxygen, but as long as you were going beyond oxygen, we discovered that these calculations were leading to a, a very significant overbinding. And at the same time, uh, nuclei came out too small. As you can see in the bottom panel, uh, the prediction of the radii being, being uh, systematically too small. And eventually, that led to uh, an error that uh, was about 20% with respect to experimental data uh, in the mid in the mid uh, to 210. We knew that this was, what was to be blamed was the Hamiltonian because the different many body method I mentioned, perturbative and non-perturbative were, were leading to the same solution, the same result, which means that the way we were solving the Schrodinger equation was, was much more accurate than this 20% error. And so the error was to be blamed on the Hamiltonian. So there was a, a, a lot of work in the years 2000 uh, the end of 2010 uh, to design 
uh, novel Carroll effective field theory interaction, um, which were consistent. And uh, actually, here is an example where uh, collaborators in, in uh, colleagues in, in uh, Darmstadt generated a new Carroll Hamiltonian at next leading order, next to next leading order, and N3LO, and repeated the same set of calculation. And here is what you obtain. So the empty circle are the next to leading order results, so very uh, low order calculation. Then you, you go higher in this organization of the uh, nuclear interaction to next uh, to next to leading order in blue. And you see that you are already in, in a excellent agreement with uh, data and uh, going to N3 alone does not change significantly the results. So you are basically, uh, you feel like you are quite converged in the expansion of the Carroll interaction. So this was uh, very satisfactory because um, you could see that uh, we had prior to 2020, uh, sort of at least for ground state observable, uh, successful ab initio description of doubly closed shell nuclei up to mass uh, 80 or so. Uh, I've insisted enough on the fact that, and I quoted several sources of uncertainty, so um, you have to evaluate different sources of uncertainty. Um, I will skip that because of time, but I'm happy to go back to it. If you remember, there is uncertainty associated with the Hamiltonian and uncertainty associated with solving of the Schrodinger equation. And so we are today making a huge effort in trying to, maybe not in all calculation we do, but in, in many of the calculation we do, trying to associate error to this calculation. Um, so I will skip quickly this, but I'm happy to go back to it if you want to learn more about this. I'd like to rather go to continue my story about extending the reach of ab initio calculation over the nuclear chart. So uh, around 2010, with uh, these novel expansion methods, we were basically uh, limited to doubly closed shell nuclei. And so the question was, uh, I've already, the answer is already in the question, do these methods, uh, were those methods applicable to all types of nuclei? As, as I already said, no, and I will explain you why. Um, and in addition, most of these calculations were limited to, um, to uh, ground state. So there is also the question of, can we extend this, uh, these techniques to do more of a spectroscopy? So let me explain why those methods were limited to uh, doubly closed shell nuclei. So in, in nuclear physics, as, as you know, uh, if we look at a, at a mean field approximation, which is exactly what we start from in the expansion method, uh, we do a, a spherical artifoc, for instance, a spherical artifoc mean field calculation. We obtain uh, sets of single particle shell, as you all know, and because of spherical symmetry, because H commutes with angular momentum operator J square, uh, oops, I'm stuck here. Oh. Sorry, I have to share again. Is it working for everyone here? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, if you think of if you think of your basic uh, set of spherical shell, as you know, shells are degenerated to J plus one time. And this leads to in the Artrifoc approximation, you fill up your levels from below with whatever number of nucleons you have. And for certain configuration, you end up with closed shell uh, configurations, a certain number of neutrons and protons. Sometimes you even have a major closed shell, which leads to the notion of magic numbers. And at the crossing of this uh, of this uh, closed shell, or here major closed shell, you have doubly uh, magic nuclei. And also for subclosed shell, you can have doubly subclosed shell or doubly closed shell nuclei. Now, what, why this categorization is important for my story is because precisely 
uh, when you are in a closed shell situation, it means that your mean field state, your start from the, the, the this unperturbed state, you you start uh, before adding correlation, is in a configuration where all the levels are completely filled up to the Fermi level and then completely empty. And so when the correlation are added with this wave operator I was mentioning, this omega k, it what does this omega k do? It does what you all know, it creates particle hole excitations, basically. Uh, and because there is a, a gap between the last occupied shell and the first empty shell, actually these correlations are, are important, but are said to be weak because they are suppressed because of this gap uh, between the, the, the last occupied and the first empty. So that's that's fine. And then when you go and add your correlation, for instance, you do the simplest thing, which is many body perturbation theory I was talking about. So here I give you the explicit formula for the second order correction to, to the binding energy due to uh, perturbation theory. And because there is this gap, e explicit finite gap between the last occupied and the first empty level, uh, you see that in the denominator of this expression, this is exactly the distance between two particle, two hole. And because you have this gap, this denominator is strictly positive, and your expansion, when you add correlation, is well behaved. But if you are in an open shell situation like this, then you are in some form of difficulty because you can see that because the last shell is only partially occupied in an open shell system, then you can promote nucleons to the same shell at zero energy cost. And when you go back to this uh, correction from perturbation theory to the binding energy, you realize that some denominators can be zero precisely because of this open shell nature. And this is the fingerprint that open shell nuclei are not weakly correlated, but are strongly correlated. So, and it also leads to the fact that your formulation is not gonna work because you have this zero energy denominator. So basically, the, this relate to uh, your reference state, your unperturbed state uh, has been badly chosen for open shell system. The problem we are facing is that on the nuclear chart, uh, if you do the numbering, uh, basically there are about 9% of nuclei only that are doubly closed shell, and about 90% of nuclei that are either singly open shell or doubly open shell. So if you want to design a method to solve the Schrodinger equation in some sort of universal way, uh, you have to do better than just method that can work for doubly closed shell nuclei. And this is the case of the methods I've talked about so far, because again, whenever you are in an open shell, you cannot apply the expansion. It's ill-defined because of these, essentially these zero energy denominators. So, what can you do uh, to uh, beat this problem? You have to go back to the beginning of the story in your uh, when you do your uh, expansion method and your partitioning. And basically one option, which is one we are following, especially uh, in, in, the, in our group at Saclay, but also in other groups uh, around the world, is the following. So uh, first you have to remember that the Hamiltonian display a certain number of symmetries, and in particular, rotational symmetry, meaning that the Hamiltonian commutes with uh, J square, and also uh, gauge symmetry, meaning that your system has a good number of particles, nuclei has a specific number of particles, and meaning that the Hamiltonian commutes with the particle number operator. So that's a fact that the Hamiltonian displays such symmetries, but so far, we implicitly assume that in your partitioning into the easy part and the hard part, H0 and H1, we required H0, the easy part, to fulfill the same symmetries. And that's why we had a, a mean field approximation for theta zero, which was spherical r prefoc, because we were enforcing to have good rotational symmetry. And this rotational symmetry leads to this 2j plus 1 degeneracy in the single particle state and leads to problem in open shell situation. So one way to basically think outside the box is to relax the condition that H0 has to fulfill the same symmetry as the total Hamiltonian H. 
And that's exactly a good idea because, so if you do that, your unperturbed state, your mean field state you will start from will be slightly more general than before. Before you were fulfilling symmetries, so you were basically using spherical artery fog. But now, if you allow uh, uh, angular momentum and or particle number symmetry to be broken, your mean field state will be more general and will become a deform artery fog or a deform artery fog Bogoliubov state. And this already means that uh, your unperturbed state will capture already more correlation than before because you will lower your energy and you will capture this very difficult strong static correlation. And this translates further into the fact. So yeah, so physically speaking, uh, singly open shell nuclei require that you break uh, particle number symmetry. This is nothing but the physics of superfluidity. And doubly open shell nuclei require that you further uh, break angular momentum symmetry, SU2, which means nothing but you bring explicitly the, the physics of deformation into your formulation. And why is that uh, extremely uh, uh, crucial? Is because if you were enforcing spherical symmetry, you had this degeneracy problem on the left. But now, if you allow your artifact state to deform in space, you will see at the same time that your set of single particle level will split. There will no be 2j plus 1 degeneracy. That's nothing but the Nielsen diagram idea. It will split the degeneracy. And when you fill up your level again, you will be in a deform closed shell uh, consider a situation such that you can you have no zero ed energy denominator anymore if you apply again perturbation theory on top of this more general state. This philosophy is, is the one that uh, you need to apply to generalize the method that were available for closed shell in which we enforce good symmetry. Now to go to open shell you have to as I just said, uh, open the box and allow more general starting states, uh, unperturbed states, by allowing symmetry to spontaneously break. So typically, again, uh, either breaking particle number symmetry to do to allow your state to become artifact Bogolyubov, and also uh, eventually uh, allow to break rotation symmetry in doubly open shell to deform. And on top of such a state, you can go uh, again and develop expansion method, again, perturbative or non-perturbative, which are now more general than before because they are based on the more general reference state. And that's why that's what we did uh, back in 2005 for uh, perturbation theory. So we developed the so-called deformed Bogolyubov many-body perturbation theory. Uh, it was implemented first in 2018. Uh, only breaking U1 symmetry, but keeping sphere, spherical symmetry. And then last year, allowing both SU2 and U1 to be broken at the same time. Then you can generalize the non-perturbative method in the same spirit. So the, actually the first thing we did at Saclay about 10 years ago with Vittorio and Soma was to apply this philosophy for uh, Green's function methods. Uh, in fact, this formulation with U1 breaking was formulated back in the 50s by Gorkov, and we and it waited for 2013 to be applied in, in nuclei. Uh, then we develop the same philosophy now for the uh, another perturbative method, which is copper cluster theory. So this becomes Pogolyubov copper cluster theory. Uh, the Oak Ridge group developed the same idea, only breaking SU2 symmetry. So that's just deformed copper cluster. And with this, you can, uh, and then, sorry, last but not least, we develop uh, the same idea for the third in medium similarity renormalization group method, although this has not been implemented yet. So uh, these are novel many body formalisms. I don't want to uh, go into the, their formal detail. But I just would like to mention, uh, just for you to appreciate what type of work goes into this, is that when you develop novel many-body formalism, you have to 
basically derive the mathematical equations. That's don't 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 mind the detail. And one technique to that is very useful to to derive uh, working equations for novel formalism is to use something you, I'm sure you have encountered in your in your education, which are uh, many body diagrams. That means Feynman diagrams. Uh, however, at some point, the formalism I just mentioned become so complex mathematically that it becomes, even with the help of diagrams, it becomes overwhelming to derive the equation by hand. So for instance, just to flash, the, doesn't mind to, to that you understand this, of course, but for instance, just to flash in one of the methods that we have developed, I just plot the, the, the diagrams that enter at second order in the expansion. Uh, that is doable by hand, but uh, I, if I were to show you the diagrams that enter at the next order, that would become uh, tens of pages of, of diagrams and you cannot do it by hand. So I'm happy to mention this because the solution to that, which is quite novel in many body physics, is to design numerical codes that allow you to derive the diagram and the mathematical equation in an automated fashion. And so at Saclay, we have developed a program where we uh, have designed such a code that basically derives Feynman diagrams and their expression automatically for several of the many body formalism I mentioned. So first we did it first for Bogolyubov many body perturbation theory, then for another one, and then a third one. And this idea of, of having a code, a numerical code that derive diagrams and mathematical expression automatically is something very intense uh, in the many body community at large in uh, quantum chemistry, in condensed matter and in nuclear physics. And uh, as a matter of fact, we organize in June at ESNT uh, a workshop across these various fields of many body physics around this notion of automated tools for many body uh, theory for mathematical uh, derivations. Uh, so if you're interested, please uh, join. So I'm getting close to the end. So I just want to mention that, uh, of course, I'm not reaching the end of my talk, but that's OK. So basically, with this idea of breaking symmetries, we were able to, in 2013, to basically do open shell system. And at first, we only broke U1 symmetry and not spherical symmetry. So we could do semi-magic nuclei. And basically, that's what we did. So I'm going to go a little bit fast here. Uh, with this Gorkov cell consistent Green's function with uh, Vittorio at Saclay and collaborators. And here, what I show you is uh, binding energy uh, of seven isotopic chains uh, near calcium isotope. Oops, so surrounding calcium isotopes, calculation beyond few doubly closed shell. So now you can do systematic isotopic chains. So on the left is absolute binding energy against experiments. Uh, this is done at a certain order in our uh, expansion, which is called ADC2. Doesn't mind the detail. Uh, for some doubly closed shell calcium, we could go to the next order. And you can see here how, so these are the bars, uh, and how by going to the next order, you get indeed much closer to the experimental data as opposed to the uh, ADC2 level of calculation, which is our bread and butter uh, level of calculation. On the right, you can see the so-called two neutron shell gap, which is basically the difference of two successive two neutron separation energies. So this is a measure of the magicity, if you want, uh, of the magic gap uh, out of total binding energies again for the same isotopic chain. Uh, so at the end of the day, if you look at this whole set of prediction, uh, you will see that at the ADC2 level, we reach uh, error to experiment, which is about 3%. And for the cases where we could go to the next order to ADC3, we reach 0.6% uh, error to the binding energy. 
For child radii, we are typically uh, 6% error in the prediction, even though some chiral effective interaction that have been optimized for radii can reach uh, error below 1%. What is interesting on the right-hand side is that you see as we go away from calcium, uh, we are going into doubly open shell system and our calculation deteriorates, in fact. And to, to go quick, we could identify that this was exactly because when we go to doubly open shell, the error to the data seemed to be correlated with uh, the lack of explicit uh, deformation in our calculation. So basically, uh, in this calculation, we were not yet breaking rotational symmetry, so we didn't have yet deformation. And when we get to doubly closed shell, uh, clearly, uh, this error we make to the data can be correlated with empirical measure of deformation. So then there are two ways of including this missing quadrupole correlation. We can either not break rotational symmetry, but we have to go much higher in our power series expansion, and this becomes extremely expensive. Or we can indeed additionally break SU2 symmetry uh, in order to now start from uh, deform HFB state and not uh, uh, spherical HFB state. So with this, we have a natural inclusion of quadrupole correlation without increasing the cost of our polynomial method. The problem is that this uh, effective reduction of NDIM I was talking about, thanks to J coupling, cannot be used anymore when we break rotational symmetry. So we, are, we have to face even more the problem of this dimensionality, and this is what makes this uh, um, challenging, but this is def allowing deformation to, to come in is, is yet the most efficient way of going to doubly open shell systems. And that's what we have developed the most recently. And uh, I guess my time is up. So I will, uh, I will stop here. Um, I had a last set of development related to the going beyond ground state. And uh, recently, several groups, including ourselves, have developed extension of those methods to tackle collective excitations, rotational bands, and, rotation, and vibrational excitation, which for the first time can be calculated ab initio uh, in both closed shell and open shell. And this was thanks to yet another set of methods that I will not uh, discuss in detail. And um, at the end of the day, uh, this leaves us with a set of challenges for the future. And let me quickly go through this in two minutes. Um, so as I said, first big challenge in ab initio is the evaluation of uncertainty. So I, I didn't have time to discuss this, but basically, as I said, uh, whenever we truncate the chiral effective field theory expansion of the Hamiltonian, we necessarily have a uncertainty associated with this approximation to the Hamiltonian we have to evaluate, and there are ways to do that. Then next, there is also our expansion uh, of the many-body solution of the Schrodinger equation, which is also cut at a certain order. So we have to be able to evaluate the percentage of error we make there. There is this uh, basis dimension, this NDIM limitation I was, I've been talking about uh, quite a bit at the beginning. So we have to make sure that our bases are large enough. And finally, uh, there is this, the fact that the Hamiltonian to begin with has fitted parameter, and then we have to account for statistical uncertainty associated with the fit of this parameter. Uh, all these uncertainties in one way or another means that instead of having to solve your Schrodinger equation once, you have to solve it uh, a very large number of times. So whenever before we were solving only one time the Schrodinger equation to have one number, if we want to have error bars associated with these various sources of error, it's in one way or another equivalent to solving the Schrodinger equation many, many, many times. So this uncertainty actually adds a humongous cost to, uh, to the calculation, but that's something we have to face. Okay. 
Now, you can be happy or not with your error. If you're not happy, you have to be more accurate. So more accurate simply means you have to go to the next order, either in the expansion of the Hamiltonian or in the expansion of your wave function or in both. And in one way or another, this is also increasing the cost uh, very significantly if you need. I will skip that. Then I said that we are limited to about mass, mass 100 uh, because of this endim uh, limit of the basis. And uh, this is a huge challenge to go to heavier mass uh, because of that. So it's, it's more than anything, a, a storage problem on, on, on the computer. Even on the biggest computer, we are quite limited in, in storing these Hamiltonian uh, tensors. And so there are ideas nowadays to try to go around this problem by apply, applying some uh, applied mathematics techniques. Uh, for instance, on, so one option goes under the name of tensor factorization. So we try to factorize those tensors that we have to store in order to store them in a much more economical way. And hopefully with this sort of techniques, we can beat this problem and go to Avian, even heavier system. I've told you a lot about the challenge that existed and to some extent still exists to go from closed shell to open shell. This uh, requires novel formalisms and we have developed quite many of them in order to compare them. But this comes with uh, uh, also an increasing cost because we cannot use this uh, trick of reducing endim to a, a much lower effective value. And so that also requires some applied mathematical tool tricks to, uh, to leverage this, this cost. And finally, I would say the most exciting thing uh, in the very, very recent uh, months or year is the possibility to uh, really enlarge the set of observable. And in particular, we are designing or putting a lot of effort into uh, calculating uh, not only ground states or, or um, properties or some form of uh, individual excitations, but also trying ab initio to calculate collective excitations, uh, as well as clustering collective phenomena and so on and so forth. And this is now becoming available from ab initio calculation. With this, uh, I thank you for your attention.